History as it happens, January 27th, 2022. The Great Inflation. My instinctive judgment is that the State of the Union is excellent, but the state of our economy is not so good. There is only one point on which all advisors have agreed. We must whip inflation right now. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. If price increases are what you're worried about, the best answer is my Build Back Better plan. Rising prices are eating into Americans' earnings in a way not seen since the 1970s and early 80s. The effects of the pandemic are one factor, but what about the Fed's easy money policy? Low interest rates, quantitative easing, and a bursting balance sheet. They may be responsible for years of asset inflation, leading to the price inflation now rocking the economy. Thomas Honig warned us this would happen, and he's going to tell us why next as we re- Report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. When you have inflation for 12 months or whatever it may be, I'm just taking an example and not making an estimate, then, then you have a price increase, but you don't have an inflation process. So I think the word transitory has different meanings to different people. To, to many, it carries a time, a sense of, uh, of short-lived. I mean, they have some huge challenges ahead of them. Because as Powell testified, they know they have an inflation problem. They know they have to get the tapering finished. They know they have to raise interest rates. And as they do, the economy is likely to slow. If you're around my age, I was born in 75, we might be excused for believing the U.S. economy had kicked inflation, price inflation, for good. Especially in recent years, when the annual inflation rate struggled to reach even 2%. So I was too young in the 1970s to have any memory of the last period of sustained high inflation in America, when the problem was so bad, 12.4% in 1974, President Gerald Ford announced a national volunteer organization called WIN, Whip Inflation Now. None of the remedies proposed, great or small, compulsory or voluntary, stands a chance unless they are combined in a considered package in a concerted effort, in a grand design. The win campaign was a loser. But as for policy, Ford, in his first presidential address to Congress just days after Nixon's resignation in August 74, called for cutting federal spending and raising income taxes. My first priority is to work with you to bring inflation under control. Inflation is domestic enemy number one. To restore economic confidence, the government in Washington must provide some leadership. Ford's ideas ran into economic realities and congressional opposition. There was a recession, and as Sean Wilentz put it in his book, The Age of Reagan, a new phenomenon strangling the economy, stagflation. Rising inflation combined with slow economic growth and higher unemployment, the worst of all worlds. So Ford wound up dropping his proposed tax hike in favor of a tax cut, and to cut to the end of his brief presidency, after some fierce battles battles with Congress, stagflation was brought under control and the inflation rate fell to about 6% in 1976. But during this decade, monetary policy, low interest rates set by the Federal Reserve, also played an important role. We had inflation again, and then the Fed tightened. We started another recession, the Fed eased, and then inflation took off. And between 1975 and 19. 79, we systematically had very low policy interest rates for that almost that entire period. There was some increase in it, but it started with real rates, real policy rates, negative. Thomas Honig was the president of the Federal Reserve Regional Bank in Kansas City from 1991 to 2011. He was also a member of the Federal Open Market Committee, and throughout 2010, he was often the lone dissenting vote against Ben Bernanke's easy money policies. But his concerns about low interest rates, inflation, asset bubbles go back to the 1970s when he was a bank examiner. Our conversation with Thomas Honig is coming up in a moment. Let's return now to the 1970s. As mentioned, inflation had dropped by the time Ford left office, but reached double digits again in 1979. Unemployment was stuck at about 6%. There was an Islamic revolution in Iran and another oil crisis. 
and President Jimmy Carter on July 15th of that year addressed the American people, not about the perils of inflation alone, but about something deeper gnawing at the spirit of American society. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We can see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our own lives and in the loss of a unity of purpose for our nation. Iran, stagflation, malaise, they all sank Carter's presidency, while inflation kept rising to 13% in 1980. Not until Fed Chairman Paul Volcker increased interest rates to 20%, yes, 20%, was inflation tamed well into Reagan's first term. Again, we're talking about price inflation here. But as Thomas Honig will explain, asset inflation was and is to this day even more problematic, fueled by the easy money policy he came to oppose in the years after the 2008 crash. Thomas Honig is a distinguished senior fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Well, we're delighted to have you, given the fact inflation is in the news every single day. In a recent profile of your worldview, your approach to central banking and interest rates, etc., Politico described you as one of America's least understood dissidents. Do you see yourself as a poorly understood dissident? Not really. I do see myself as an individual who other policymakers disagreed with pretty consistently, but they understood what I was saying. Now, the public may not have understood, but they were not they were not exposed to the issues or to who I was at the time. So I think there were those who painted me as someone who thought inflation was immediately on the horizon when I had said many times that I'm concerned about not just the short run, but the long run, but also, shall we say, the consensus or the profession of economics has, over many years, focused on general price inflation that we're experiencing now. And my arguments were and are that inflation is broader than that. You have asset inflation, which can have very adverse effects if it gets out of control, not just bubbles, but general increases in the price of assets. And that is every bit as important as general price inflation. But most people, including policymakers at the Fed and elsewhere, focus on just price inflation. That's why it's getting the attention it is today and didn't get the attention that I'd hoped it would get in 2010 and beyond. Price inflation, you go to the grocery store, what have you, and asset inflation, well, when people look at their 401ks and, whoa, a 25% jump in one year, you were... Uh, well, not only that, but houses are more expensive. It's right. harder to get into the market and so forth. So there are adverse effects as well. You were a bank examiner in the 1970s. I'd like to touch on your background a bit, but what economic school of thought do you find yourself subscribing to now? More along the lines of, frankly, uh, an Austrian economics model where you are concerned about where real interest rates are relative to nominal rates or policy rates, that you are concerned about the allocation of capital towards inflation of assets as well as price inflation. People say it's conservative, it's so forth, but I think it is a, a very legitimate theoretical approach to thinking about the economy and what I subscribe to. And to your earlier point about how well understood these concepts are among the general public, well, I'll be the first to admit that my grasp of economics, financial policy or fiscal policy, monetary policy is not great. That's why I have you on the podcast to explain these things. <laughs> but generally speaking, in the mass media, coverage of the Fed is not, say, anywhere close to coverage of the White House. I mean, there are outlets like the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, that cover the Fed closely. But right. for the most part, this you know, quantitative easing, ask the average person what impact QE had after the 2008 crash. That's correct. It is uh, esoteric. It is more technical. And, and I think your eyes glaze over when you start talking about things like that. But it does affect every individual's life. So it is extremely important. While it can't be understood in great detail, I think the American public would be well served by reading more about it, trying to understand it. They have an instinctive knowledge in a way. They know when they see price inflation. They do know that something was out of whack when assets were doubling in value and their real incomes were stagnant. 
So they do understand the fundamentals as it affects them, but the technical elements actually adds to some degree the confusion in the public's Mm. mind about policy. And as Warren Buffett has said, if your stock portfolio doubles overnight, don't get excited, get nervous. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Paraphrasing. That's not his exact (laughs) quote. So you've been concerned not just about inflation, but easy money policy and the consequences in general. Going back a long time, as I mentioned, uh, your background as a bank examiner in the Mm -hmm. 1970s. So let's talk a little bit about the 1970s right now, because that is the last period in American history where inflation was a real problem. For the longest time, the Fed was concerned that inflation could barely hit 2% annually. Well, Mm -hmm. we're on the other end of the spectrum. So what were the problems with the Fed in the 1970s, especially the late 70s, after the 73 oil embargo by OPEC, a period of time remembered for stagflation, and you can pick it up from there. Well, first of all, remember you had the Vietnam War, you had the Great Society in the late 60s, you had inflation showing some pressure. And as President Nixon came into office, you had basically inflation rising close to 5%. And you had a recession coming on. Nixon then found himself also with changes in the economy. We had an open trade policy. We really ran, I think, one of our first trade deficits in the early 70s. And he introduced wage and price controls that had the effect of temporarily slowing inflation, but it also seeded excess demand. So then you went through a period of, as he left office and Gerald Ford came in, you had another period where you had inflation. Ford was going to address that, higher taxes, but the economy went into recession. So he immediately reversed course. uh, And we were doing tax cuts and increasing spending, and the Fed was lowering interest rates so that the economy would pick up. We had inflation again, and then the Fed tightened. We started another recession, the Fed eased, and then inflation took off. And between 1975 and 19. 79, we systematically had very low policy interest rates for that almost that entire period. There was some increase in it, but it started with real rates, real policy rates, negative. And then they slowly increased, but they were very strong impetus to economic demand, to consumer and business demand. And you had at that period, what you see recently in ours, that is asset prices were rising. And this is the important thing. Asset prices were rising. Banks were willing to lend because money was easy. Interest rates were very low, relatively speaking, in terms of real rates. And when you say assets, do you mean land or or stocks? Land, uh, the stock market, maybe to some extent. Real estate, commercial real estate, energy. Energy was rising quickly. Oil was going from $10 a barrel to people thought it was going to be $50 and $100. Agricultural land that was relatively inexpensive became more expensive. And banks... We're then beginning to lend, not just on the future cash flows that that might generate, but on the fact that those asset values are going up and their collateral was only going to be worth more. And you saw lenders making loans for 100% of the construction value of the project on the expectation that it would be worth 100% of the loan by the time it was completed. They could easily deal with it. If the borrower got in trouble, they could unload that. So you have the speculative bubble beginning, and that carried over from assets to prices. And so you had both an asset inflation and you had a price inflation. And it was so bad because it was a start and stop. Easy money, fiscal expansion, tight. Then when things slowed down, easy money, fiscal expansion, asset values would increase. You would then tighten and then the economy would slow. Unemployment might rise and you back off. And each time they restarted, inflation was a little higher. And by the time the end of the the 70s came in October 1979, inflation was 14%. And at that point, Paul Volcker was actually put in that job, and he was given basically the mandate, and at least he felt it was his mandate, and I think it was, to deal with this inflation finally. And the way he did that was to stop the growth in money, and interest rates rose to 20%. And we went through this huge recession. He intentionally caused a recession with high interest Well, the fact that you have these rates having to rise to get inflation down Mm -hmm. from 14% down to six, recession was inevitable. And uh, that's the price you pay by stop and go policies through the period. And that is a lesson learned. 
And we have to learn that lesson as we go forward from here. As a profile in Politico described it, it was a self-reinforcing logic of asset bubbles. When you have zero interest rates, asset values will go up, and they did. And when you are pumping money in to keep that and funding the government's debt, a couple of things to keep in mind. In 2008, the government's debt was about $10 trillion. By 2015, it was $18 trillion. Pre-pandemic, it was around $24, $25 trillion. Post-pandemic, it's $30 trillion. And the Fed has helped keep interest rates low by bringing a lot of that debt onto its own balance sheet. So the Fed's balance sheet, which was only $900 billion in 2008, was $4.5 trillion in 2015. And today, post-pandemic, it's $9 trillion. That's a huge expansion of money, a very long period of zero interest rates. So the economic system of the United States, and actually globally, has created an equilibrium, an unstable equilibrium, in my opinion, around zero. And so from that, over that period of the decade of the 2010 to 2019, you had asset inflation, stock market doubled in value, more than doubled in value. Real estate, land real estate increased, I think, at least double. Like, so all that money you needs ha- to find a place to go, right? It has to be deployed and it was used more speculatively. Corporations, rather than invest in plant and equipment to the same extent as they might have, they reshaped their balance sheet. You can borrow at zero. Why not replace your equity with cheap borrowings? Mm-hmm. Why not do stock buybacks? Why not use this cheap money to acquire other firms? And so you began this kind of speculative momentum that further increase the asset values as we move forward. I want to return to the 1970s and Ford and Carter and how they handled this problem. But one other point or question, I always wonder, why does the U.S. economy, why do corporations need so much stimulus? Access to cheap loans, cheap capital, I mean, is that really our problem? In other words, why do interest rates have to stay at zero? Profits are good right now. Earnings on Wall Street are strong. Companies are sitting on huge piles of cash. So why does the U.S. economy need so much stimulus? Low taxes, deregulation. I'll speak mostly to the monetary aspect of it and maybe some of the fiscal. But the idea is, okay, there's long-run consequences of policy and there's short-run consequences. And when the economy is in trouble, by making money easy, you encourage greater willingness to borrow, to spend money, to bring the economy back. The difficulty is when you do that, then pulling back becomes very difficult. Politicians love easy money. The public have the perception that, well, if interest rates low, that must be good. Buy a house. So you can buy a house and pay a low interest rate, even though your ability to buy the house is compromised because the house doubles in value. So new entrants into that market They may have low interest rates, but they're paying twice as much for it. So it actually has long run consequences that are not necessarily positive. But in the short run, it's very attractive. And so that makes politicians very, very happy with easy money. It makes the public happy with it. And therefore, it puts enormous pressure on the central bank. That's why it should be more independent and should act more independently. And therefore, you get these extended periods of easy money that eventually lead to asset price inflation. And then price inflation, which has very serious negative consequences. But in the short run, you don't see that. You don't feel that. And therefore, you want easy money until you don't. And therein lies the difficulty of conducting policy anywhere in the world, and certainly in the United States. It's perceived as good until it's not. Something that's hard for me to grasp is how much of a factor is Federal Reserve central bank policy in this entire constellation of events and economic factors. Uh, For instance, in the 1970s, we had things like deindustrialization, the U.S. auto industry performing very poorly, job manufacturing jobs moving overseas. I mean, there's a whole number of issues that affect, you know, the big picture. Well, central bank policy is huge, but you're right. It's not the only factor. Factors affect supply in the real economy as well as demand. The Fed focuses primarily on demand, as does fiscal policy. So let's talk about the deindustrialization issue. So the U.S. was an open economy. Japan was on the rise then, and it was producing a very high quality industrial output, automobiles, for example. And when the industry, automobile industry was challenged because they were producing, in people's mind, a less quality car, 
for more money and Japan comes in, you have a shift towards demand there that affects employment in the United States in the auto industry and in other industries that supply that. So those are factors that are very important. And then you have the oil embargo that hurt a lot. And the thought is, well, then the government has to step in. And to some extent it does. But if the economy is in a structural change, monetary policy can't solve that issue. It has to go through that process. But if it attempts to do so, and it does so too much, then it puts too much money in as the economy begins to change and you get the inflationary outcome because output isn't being increased. It's changing until it can reestablish an equilibrium and begin to produce again. Mm -hmm. and, and to give you an example, I'm often, I'm sometimes asked this question, well, in the 2010 period, the idea was to increase demand, increase production, make things more productive. But if you look at things, in the 90s, when we were coming out of a recession, interest rates were higher. They were down for a while, and then they were raised early in 1994. Compared to the period 2010 to 2018, let's say, the increase in productivity was twice as high in the 90s with higher interest rates than they were in the 2010 period. Real wages increased three times the rate. And so higher interest rates did not impinge on the productivity of the economy. It actually was very good. Neither did higher taxes. At, well, higher taxes, they slow the economy. You know, if you're going to spend more money, you have to tax more or the Fed has to come in and buy that debt. And so you get distortions in the market as you try and manage through structural changes. My view is what monetary policy has to do is stay neutral, maybe three, four percent, maybe lower some when the economy slow, but not go to zero so that the economy can restructure. The market will take care of things slowly, maybe slower than you want, but as fast as it can. When you try too hard to intervene in that, you cause further distortions, asset value, inflation, and so forth. I want to just briefly return to the 1970s, sure. if, if you don't mind. I know we're bouncing around a lot here, but that's, that's all right. That's I mean, how... it's your, it's your, you, you take it where you want it. I'll try and answer my uh, question. Trying to keep it, uh, yeah, trying to keep it coherent, not only for me, but uh, for the sake of the yeah. listener. 1973, the OPEC oil embargo, and by the following year in 74, inflation hits 12.4%. We talked about Gerald Ford in his first presidential address to Congress. He said inflation was domestic enemy number one. It does no good to blame the public for spending too much when the government is spending too much. And by the end of the decade, we have Jimmy Carter and we're dealing with stagflation again. And Carter is, of course, remembered for his dismal TV performance, the so-called malaise speech. I mean, he did not cause those problems by himself, but his response to them were seen as weak and ineffective. For the first time in the history of our country, a majority of our people believe that the next five years will be worse than the past five years. So I'm assuming that you believe both Ford and Carter didn't really handle this all that well. I guess it's a question of what should they have done differently? Maybe had a Paul Volcker in there earlier? I think President Ford started out, he had it right. Inflation was higher than it should have been. He was going to address that. The trouble is he ran into a recession and he ran into this oil embargo and he ran into those factors. And you know, the thing is, when you do that and people are unemployed, they don't really care about your your long run. Yeah. They care about now. And if you're unemployed, it's horrible. And that puts a lot of pressure on the presidents and on others to do something else. And he did. He reversed himself. He advocated for tax cuts. It did stimulate the economy. And as he did that, he also got more inflation over that period. And then you had Carter come in. You Again, you want to see people employed. We had a relatively stagnant economy, interest rates were low, and they were kept low. And during a good part of that period, when he came in in 77, he had a, a environment where people were still wanting to see demand increase. The Fed had low interest rates. They kept them low for a period, trying to stimulate the economy. What you ended up with is more inflation. I mean, interest rates were negative when uh, Ford was in, when Carter came in, they stayed low and they remained basically below the growth in the economy, which is stimulative. Inflation kept rising from 8% to 10% to 12% and then to 
you know, he then appointed in 1979, he appointed Paul Volcker and he moved Miller, who was the chairman of the Fed, then to the secretary of the Treasury at that point. Paul Volcker knew his mandate was you've got to get inflation taken care of. And he did. And I'll give Carter credit for putting him in that role. And instead of using a scalpel, because this problem had been going on for so long and not just inflation, Volcker used an axe, hiking interest rates to what, 20 percent? I mean, that's incredible to think of something like that. But inflation did fall 13.5 to 6.2, which is still fairly high. High. But at least it was on the trend down and you could ease off. The 70s were this period of stop, go, stop, go. You had wage and price controls twice. You had low interest rates. You had government tightening and government easing. Even when Volcker came in, you had not only his higher rates, but they did credit controls. Absolutely unbelievable. In March, I think, of 1980, the president invoked this power to control credit growth. And they had this elaborate bureaucracy set up and they signed it to the Fed under the law. And so by Volcker's trying to manage the economy and stop inflation with higher interest rates, you put this credit controls in. That did slow things down. But then they released it. Things picked up and then inflation was still a problem and you had to keep policy tight. And therefore, you had this very disruptive stop go policy that I think was detrimental to that decade. 1981, you just mentioned it. Inflation did tick back up again, and that sent Volcker into uh, super Volcker mode. You know, we often look back at the Reagan tax cuts in the 1980s and how he tried to stimulate the economy after the dollars of the, the late 1970s, but it was Paul Volcker's action that brought inflation under control so the economy could eventually take off. Not to digress about that, but I was going to say, you know, we don't have stagflation today as we did in the late 70s as a result of all those currents and factors. But I guess it depends on who you ask today. You know, one point you've made is that we have a middle class that feels like it's stagnating. Whereas the top earners and corporations, I mean, just look at Wall Street and, and the valuations sure. of these companies, right? There, there's a yawning gap of inequality yes. that's getting worse. Right. And that comes through not just price inflation, but through this asset inflation. Because here's what's happening. You're lowering these interest rates to zero. You're putting all this money in. It goes through Wall Street principally. Asset values go up. And if you have assets, you're a winner. Right. So if you're very wealthy or you're the upper middle income or even some of the middle income, if you have a house and so forth. But if you're a wage earner and through that period, the 2010 to 2018, your wages are pretty stagnant. It's not that your real income is dropping. It's that the wealthy in terms of their wealth in assets has grown tremendously and you've been left behind. And you see this. Yes. And you resent it. There's no question. And therefore, you become less you become less sanguine about the economic situation. I mean, you get tired you get, of hearing how strong the economy is. To your point about the asset bubbles, last couple of years, I've become a stock picker for my own. You yeah. know? <laughs> and I thought I was a genius. Well, yes. everybody is in a bull market right. when that's the goal of quantitative easing. It's to lower interest rates across the yield curve, all interest rates. That means that people will, you know, you can't put it in a bond or a short-term treasury or anything like that and get any return. You can't put it in a CD and get any return. So you have to go to a more risk-oriented asset like the stock market. And if everyone is going to the same place at the same time, what's going to happen? And so you, you create this artificial gain in wealth and you leave some behind and you're not really better off because if you wanted to buy a new house, you'd have to pay a lot more anyway. You're actually distorting the economy and that's a real concern. So on that point, distortions in the economy, the excessive commodification of credit, the 08 crash. We don't have time to get into all the causes of what happened there for the purposes of this podcast. But the response to it was, Bernanke, we have to intervene in a historic manner. It wasn't just monetary policy. Of course, Congress and the stimulus bill under Obama, which some said was too small. Others said it was too large or it wasn't targeted properly. This is where you started to earn, I don't know if earn is the right word, your (laughs) reputation as a dissenter. Were you a dissenter right at first when interest rates were slashed basically to zero in 08? No, I was not. I was not. The purpose of the central bank is when you have a crisis like that, the idea is, idea, is that you will inject liquidity because the market freezes up. Buyers and sellers can't 
trust one another. They're uncertain. They're afraid. So the Federal Reserve comes in and provides that liquidity. It buys assets, puts money into the system. It, it kind of saves the day, if you will. I was very supportive of that's what central banks are supposed to do, provide that liquidity to solvent institutions. Now, in a crisis, it's hard to know who's solvent or not, but the Fed provided money to both solvent and some insolvent institutions. But you can't be for sure, so you do it. I did not object. I voted with the majority. My problem was, and still is, that in 2010, we were in a recovery. The recovery started, I think, in the third quarter of 2009. But in 2010, the unemployment rate was still high, but it was coming down. And it would have, I think, in my opinion, continued. But the world was still in turmoil. And the central bank, the leadership, which I have full respect for, decided that it had to do more. And therefore, it was going to do another quantitative easing, that is, provide hundreds of billions of dollars into the banking system, lower interest rates, make sure they stay close to zero. That's where I said, wait a minute, there are going to be consequences for that. And those consequences are going to be, in my words, at that point, a misallocation of resources. And by that, I mean, it's going to stimulate artificial spending, speculative investments. Um, it's going to change asset values and cause people to invest and speculate in those assets, land, housing, the stock market, all the things again, and artificially raise that. And my concern was, you're going to increase those asset values, and you are going to, shall we say, make some people on paper wealthier and other people who don't have those assets mm -hmm. less so, and you're going to leave them behind. Well, I don't and like I cliches, said, but I believe that cliche about bailing out Wall Street and not Main Street does fit. Right. Well, and I, at that point, even in 2011, and I was concerned that there were, you were bailing out Wall Street in the 2008 crisis, but you had to do it. But then in 2010 and 2011, we had these institutions that were too big to fail, which invites speculation. If you're too big to fail, creditors, they don't mind lending to you. They know they're going to get bailed out. And so you then actually increase the level of speculation and what you're willing to lend for. So you reinvent the leverage buyouts. You reinvent greater means to fund hedge funds who play basis point speculative games. You have corporations who borrow cheaply and reduce their equity, speculate on new acquisitions. So you, you create the speculative environment, which is yeah. supposed to stimulate the economy, but I think it actually hurts the economy. There was a recent story about, I cannot remember the name of this firm, but he took advantage of a loophole where he was borrowing money to buy stocks and then paying back the loans based on the appreciating stock prices, profits, sure. that works great until it doesn't work anymore. Right. And I that's forgot the leverage. name of the the name of the company, but it was a pretty well, big. There story. are many of them out there. So <laughs> that's, that's right. That's the problem. There's a lot of them. And sure, the idea it's it's kind of its own game. It's a speculative game. I borrow, the value goes up. I repay with the gain in my. I borrow more, the value goes up. It has its own vicious cycle to it. And remember, leverage is a two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's wonderful as long as things go up. But if you're holding the debt and interest rates double or triple, you are going to be bankrupt fairly quickly. And mm -hmm. that's the downside of the speculative bubble. This is all great to know, considering millions of Americans' retirements are connected to the stock market. Sure. Uh, I'm not an alarmist. I think over time, you'll be in good shape if you're indexed to the S&P 500. But, you know, right. if you're about to retire and then there's a burst bubble, well. Well, so it's, it's worse than that because... You know, with zero interest rates and the constraints on pension funds, that's why you have, I think, an increase in underfunded pension funds. Because if you can't earn anything and the only place you can go is in the stock market and you have limits to what you can do, well, you're going to fall behind. So you have that effect. And I see state governments buying assets for their sure. state pension. That's scary. Um, it is. Despite easy money policy and some might say overstimulus, inflation still was... Well, I mentioned it earlier. The Fed was worried it couldn't get inflation high enough. Right. So what's your explanation there for why well, there, you know, we didn't really have inflation as a problem until the, the pandemic? But my argument is we did have inflation as a problem. I, I mean, I thought it was unfortunate. I read the, the minutes and I read the speeches of many of the FOMC members, and they were concerned that, that inflation was only 1.8%. And you know they weren't meeting their inflation target. And I thought, what do you mean? 1.8% is close enough when you have your asset values going off the chart mm -hmm. and you're talking about this, you, you should focus more broadly and they just didn't do it. Now, 
<laughs> by doing that, you have it at 7%. It just shoots up. Now, pandemic, critically, it's like the oil shock, yeah. only worse. So you have this shock. You have the supply being constrained. But you're still stimulating demand. Asset values continue to go up. Wall Street's a winner. Now, inflation's going up actually faster than wages. People are losing ground, and they're unhappy, and they should be. Yeah. And so that's the problem with only focusing on one dimension of inflation. And I fell into that trap again with my, my question, so thank you for straightening me out there. Is there adequate oversight of Fed policy? And I mentioned before that in the mass media, you know, it gets some attention, depending on what newspapers or websites you're following. But what about yeah. Congress? Um, when, when Powell is, goes to Congress, I listen, and I don't really feel like I'm learning much. And well, that, that's not a critique of Powell. It's more no, what the lawmakers are asking. That's a very good point. The issue is, yes, there's plenty of oversight for the Federal Reserve. Powell and others have to testify before Congress. They have to be accountable for this. But they're doing mostly what the Congress wants. And the Congress wants an easy money policy, usually. Politicians are very short term by nature. I mean, you're, ex- you're elected every two years on one side and every six years on the other, but relatively short. So politicians tend to want the moment taken care of. That's what Nixon wanted. That's why we had bad inflation. And so you get, you get what you want. The oversight's there. The issue is the Federal Reserve is a central bank, all central banks. They were given a long-term mandate, long-term stable employment, low and stable inflation and stable interest rates long term but if you are only focused on the short term then you will have you will have the stop go stop go kind of policies based on the moment and the central banks need to get through that think ahead i mean they have some huge challenges ahead of them because as powell testified they know they have inflation problem they know they have to get the tapering finished they know they have to raise interest rates inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic and the reopening of the economy have continued to contribute to elevated levels of inflation. And as they do, the economy is likely to slow. And if it slows and unemployment starts to rise from 3.9 to whatever the number might be, there's going to be an enormous pressure on them to back off of that. And that's when their tests will come. You know, instead of penmanship class... In my uh, Catholic elementary school, I wish I had been taught economics. Not that I would have understood it any better then than today. <laughs> you know, whether it's grade school or high school, I do think there needs to be more education in economics. I think every, I mean, you're required when you go to college to take an English course. You need to take economics. But the American public needs to read more about the economy, both the left and the right. I don't care who it is. You need to read more. And if we read just half as much about economics as we do sports, I think we'd all be better off. Not that I have anything against yeah. sports, but we need to be better informed. Uh, because I think the U.S. economy, as we address the inflation, the public is going to have to understand what is happening. And they're going to have to be patient. And if they're not, and the Fed backs off, then later on, just like in the 70s, if inflation gets even higher than 7%, uh, we're going to have then a real recession, a deep recession. And it's really, it's really difficult. Because if unemployment rises, people become impatient, understandably so. And that's when the Fed's independence matters most, and they have to stick to a policy. Now, they cannot raise rates from zero to 5% overnight. We might get a half point. We might get a half point in March. You may get a quarter or a half a point. I don't know what they're going to do. But they have to be consistent, persistent, and long-term thinking. And they can't shock the economy nor can they be too slow. They have a huge challenge ahead of them. And as I speak into this microphone in late January, we're learning the Fed is pointing to an interest rate increase in March, no sooner than that. Thomas Honig, we thank you for sharing your views with us. On the next episode of History As It Happens, Slavery and the Constitution. It'll be the first in an ongoing series of episodes about an issue that continues to vex us today, leading to new narratives and counter-narratives, placing race and slavery at the center of, well, everything. And our guest will be Joseph Ellis. That's next when we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 